Hi everyone, my name is Sophia Heyer. I'm the Gender and Social Inclusion Leader for ACRA, which is the program accelerating the impact of CJR climate research in Africa. I'm going to be talking about how CSA can support women's productivity. Uh, there is a gender gap in agriculture that we know of. Um, if you look at the slide on the right here, you'll see that uh, the World Bank and UN Women have estimated uh, in 2015, this is a little while ago, that the annual cost is very significant in three countries in, in Africa, uh, Malawi, Tanzania, and Uganda. Men and women are exposed to different climatic shocks, and therefore they have different impacts and different levels of vulnerability. Uh, women's vulnerability tends to be um, influenced by lower levels of access to resources, inputs, technology, and information, as well as less stable land tenure access. This restricts their ability to act on and implement climate adaptation in agriculture, and their resilience is therefore affected. So the gender gap and access to resources are really crucial for women's resilience uh, in relation to agriculture and other areas. Uh, women, however, are also um, largely neglected by agriculture and climate information service providers, and when they do have access to information, they have less capacity to implement it. So these are some of the issues that need to be addressed. Um, with uh, ACRA and CCAPS, we are and uh, in the past, the work that we did with the CGIR, we've been looking at how do you reduce workloads for women in relation to climate adaptation and mitigation, and what are gender-responsive technologies. We know that in every region, in many regions, women have insufficient access to technologies, energy, and labor for their agricultural production, and in many cases, um, and often cannot even begin to think about climate resilience uh, if they don't have, for example, appropriate energy technologies or access to um, appropriate transportation facilities and to move their produce and so forth. Uh, women, in, and also we find that women are often expected to contribute their labor to new CSA activities, such as weeding or processing, etc. Again, this can be a barrier and a constraint for women to understand and, and adapt climate resilient agriculture. Um, in some of the cost benefit work that we've done um, to date, we found that actually because of these restrictions and the gender gap, um, the gender productivity gap, women may actually choose a balance of CSA technologies that are more labor intensive but cheaper, as well as some technologies that may be labor reducing but which will be more expensive. So in other words, they can't afford all of the, uh, the new practices or the new technologies they have access to. They will make these um, decisions based on, you know, and, and go back and forth between um, labor intensive and labor reducing to supplement some of the new, the, to supplement cost with their labor, actually. Uh, and then we found as well that uh, migration, climate induced mig migration affects women's workload, often leaving them with increased workloads at home and in the fields. Looking at this, what, what are we looking for then? We're looking, when we are looking at gender responsive or gender transformative technology, we need technology that responds to women's knowledge, priorities, and perspectives. Uh, we've talked before about energy, transportation, food processing technologies. We need technologies that suit women's physiology and their tasks. Um, for example, if we look here at this picture of baobab production in West Africa, this is a great initiative. Uh, where women have, are working together in a community to process a new product, which is baobab juice powder, or baobab juice uh, powder, powder from baobab tree, uh, which they sell locally and which has been very, very successful, and they're expanding their markets. But you see that they're still using a very, very low-tech, very labor-heavy, labor-intensive um, method for actually making the, the powder. Uh, they, they compromise by, or they deal with this issue by sharing the labor, so it's a group activity, or they, they share the, um, the, the responsibilities for this among the, the community or the committee members. One great example of, of uh, technology that reduces women's workload but also provides gender equality and, and transform, transformative effects is this solar irrigation uh, project in Nepal. Uh, it's it was uh, it's it is placed in a rural small rural village uh, in Nepal where the men most of the men have migrated outside for work. So they've migrated to Kathmandu or to India for work. So the women are left at home managing the agricultural production as well as other duties and, and family responsibilities. Uh, they uh, the 
Organizers liaised with uh, the Women's District Committee, so there was an existing women's body, and formed a local, worked with a local women's committee to manage and maintain the solar um, solar, irrigate, solar pump for irrigation, as you see in the background there. Uh, the women now manage the pump. They know who to call and how to deal with maintenance issues. Uh, the pump is used to uh, substitute the manual irrigation that they used before with a drip irrigation method that is pumped by the, the solar power pumped, pump. So this uh, technology has not only reduced their labor load, it has actually increased their production. So now from one crop per growing season or per year, they get three. So it's tripled their production as well as reduced their workload and given them a time to work on other activities. It's also given them a sense of increased confidence and they have standing in the community, increased sense of um, confidence and, and solidarity in managing this new technology together in the community for improved results and improved well-being. So what would we say is next for gender transformative technology? What do we need to be looking at to move forward? We need to look at technology approaches and development that respond to women's knowledge, their priorities and their perspectives. For example, you know, where is the small um, powered tiller? We still see women handling hand long or short handled hose in the fields. Where are we going, when are we going to see um, a, a mechanized tiller that's easy to use, not too heavy, uh, and affordable. How do we bring together technology and climate smart approaches to agriculture to reduce women's work burden? This is, this is critical uh, and still not adequately looked at. And uh, you can, from the example I've just, just mentioned, uh, context technologies, context specific technologies and supporting measures are needed. What trade-offs and co-benefits can we get from different combinations of options to benefit women and promote the transformation of agriculture and rural development in ways that promote gender equality. We still do not have a lot of real good evidence on different options, different combinations, and some of the cost benefit um, analysis that women, women undertake when they're deciding how to, what to adopt and how to implement their adaptation practices. And finally, how do we overcome power imbalances within households, communities, and countries, as well as among different groups in a community that affect climate adaptation and resilience, and this is something that we still do not necessarily look at um, the way we should. Uh, looking at intersectionality is one way of looking at this, understanding differences of age, sex, socioeconomic level, and so forth, and ethnicity, uh, and, and is something that we sh really should be focusing on in future. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>